The United States Marine Corps Warfighting Lab is investing millions of dollars into researching and developing an insane new kind of amphibious assault vehicle that's part aircraft, part boat, and part hover thing, but all fully twice as efficient. It'll be armed to the teeth with anti-ship missiles, sea mines, and 12 heavily armed marine infantry looking for an excuse to f*** your day. You guys, this thing aims to totally rewrite the doctrine of how amphibious warfare has worked for the past few decades, from beach assaults to contested logistics. In fact, the Pentagon is hoping that this strange wing and ground concept will be able to help solve their entire sea lift challenge in the Pacific. No pressure, boys. We're all counting on you. And then we'll have to move intra-theater logistics. And frankly, that's an area that keeps me awake at night is the resupply. Keeps me awake during long, lonely nights too, sir. Today, I want to examine why this concept has failed spectacularly since the Cold War, what's changed since then that's caused China and the United States to suddenly double down on wing and ground vehicles, and why when I start conversations about this kind of stuff at parties, people politely excuse themselves. And speaking of precision strikes, when life hits you unexpectedly, you need someone who fights back just as hard. If you've ever had someone in your family who can't drive and get you into car accidents willy-nilly, or you've been hit with a folding chair during birthday party barbecues gone wrong, then you know injuries happen. If you ever get seriously hurt, your injury could be worth millions of bucks. And that's where this episode's sponsor, Morgan & Morgan, comes in. Here, allow me to sing it to you in a catchy tune. They're America's largest injury law firm with over 1,000 lawyers across all 50 states these guys don't mess around they've gotten 26 million dollars for a car crash victim in philly and 12 million dollars in florida you don't pay a thing unless they win your case okay i'll spare your ears from injury from hearing me sing anymore now so you won't sue me or or do sue me but if you do morgan and morgan might be able to help you out with that it only takes like three minutes to see if you have a case you can do the whole process from your phone without leaving the couch or even changing out of your pajamas if you've been injured and want to protect your rights, you can go to Morgan and Morgan at ForThePeople.com slash army. That's ForThePeople.com slash army. The link's in the description and pinned comment below. Thank you to Morgan and Morgan for sponsoring this episode. Now back to the show. In 1967, a United States CIA spy satellite spotted something very weird. A 100 meter long object was zipping across the Caspian Sea at around 300 miles per hour, which was far faster than any boat should be able to achieve. American intelligence noted it appeared to be moving just a few feet above the water. It looked like a plane, but it appeared to have no wings, and yet it was still capable of flight. This information confused the hell out of the US analysts. They nicknamed it the Caspian Sea monster because they couldn't categorize it. To further confuse the point, it was assigned to the Soviet Navy, but operated by test pilots from the Soviet Air Force. They broke a champagne bottle over its nose to christen its first voyage, which is a customary tradition in the Navy. This was in fact the Soviets being the first to go all in on the wing and ground concept. So how does the physics of this thing work? What's the trick here? The quote unquote ground effect phenomenon was first discovered by pilots in the 1920s when they noticed that their airplane weirdly became way more efficient when they got closer to the runway surface right before landing. The ground reduces the drag and it increases lift under the wings, which in turn creates a kind of aerodynamic cushion, which allows the aircraft to fly way more efficiently at very dangerously low altitudes. It's literally the definition of high speed, low drag. This is a huge deal to the military because it gives you way more lift for far less fuel, roughly twice the amount of efficiency, but only when you're flying just a few feet above the ground or water. To give you an idea, the distance between home plate and the pitcher's mound is just 60 feet, six inches. So they're basically flying within that margin of error. The Caspian Sea Monster kind of worked in that it flew under the radar, could carry massive payloads and had a Cold War super weapon vibe to it. It was a total total of 10 jet engines on it. From flying it around, they quickly realized though that it had some problems. It could only really fly over calm seas, it couldn't fly in bad weather, it had trouble climbing to safety. The engines required constant upkeep because flying over salt water sprayed the salt water into them which caused intense corrosion. So they struggled to figure out what it was 
actually for. It didn't take long for someone in the Soviet military to ask the most Soviet military question ever, but can we put missiles on it? So in the late 1970s, the Soviets started developing the Lund class Ekranoplan. It was armed with six ship-killing missiles and basically turned into a low-flying fast attack boat, but the dream wouldn't last long. That old Caspian Sea monster ended up crashing due to a simple pilot error when trying to make an easy turn. No one was killed, but the danger inherent in the design was on full display. The Lund class was expensive and borderline unusable in anything under than glassy calm seas, and it ended up as a kind of a beach attraction. I mean, it was really just high maintenance kind of lady. In 1992, Congress directed DARPA to investigate if these wig ideas had any real practical use. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was kind of surprising to hear that Russia and the United States actually collaborated on a joint venture to create a ground effect vehicle together. DARPA even released a public unclassified paper on their investigation. It could transport a full MEU Marine Expeditionary Unit, or it could fire missiles, or it could transport special forces to infiltrate and exfiltrate unnoticed. DARPA found that it could cost over $350 million and 40 years to develop a series of these for military use. On page 15, see how it talks about how Russian and American engineers said that a 2 million pound version was the absolute limit. And it's clear that they used this document as the basis for what they would work on next, because Boeing Phantom Works, like their skunk works at Boeing, proposed the Pelican Otra, a 2 million pound version of it. They applied for a patent in 2001, and it gave us some insight into it. Designed to carry super duper heavy cargo carrying 1,400 tons of payload, the max takeoff weight of 6 million pounds, this could completely rewrite logistics for the entire Pacific and European theater strategy. The Pelican Ultra would be able to transport a full brigade of equipment and troops to the Pacific or Europe in about four days total time instead of the two to three months that it took to load a giant row row transport ship. It could carry 2,700 tons or 17 Abrams tanks in five rows of three and one row of two. It could carry up to 8,000 troops. The thing could fly at 350 miles per hour instead of the 28 miles per hour that ships go at. The thing was like the old Spruce Goose concept from Howard Hughes that he developed in World War II. It would have a max range of about 11,500 miles, so it could fly from the United States to China and back at a low altitude, of course. So the technology would bypass the need for ports entirely, and you could go directly, skip go, go straight to the beachhead. By 2005, a few things happened though. The Pentagon realized, wait, we're fighting in the desert in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our enemy has zero chance of contesting our logistics. This is a giant waste and China's never going to be an issue for us in the future. A congressional report found it to be only marginally feasible to enter service by 2016. So the project fizzled out for other priorities, although it had created some of the technology advancements that we will see are used later on because that wasn't the end of the weird concept yet. The idea went to the Pentagon procurement development hell until 2022, about a decade later when DARPA quietly launched a project called the Liberty Lifter. They're working on it right now for it to be able to haul a full C-17 worth of gear, like 90 tons, which would be the equivalent of about two Marine amphibious combat vehicles or an Abrams tank. It would have a range of 7,500 miles, which you could comfortably get from California to the first island chain. Best yet, it wouldn't require a runway or ports, which is important because these austere environments in the first island chain are where there isn't much military infrastructure. Between the Cold War and today, the strategic calculus had changed. Pacific island hopping is now central to American military strategy. So what we said is we've been given lawful guidance in the national defense strategy to be able to deter and if necessary defeat the pacing threat of the PRC. In 2023, DARPA built and tested components for the Liberty Lifter. They awarded contracts to General Atomics and Aurora Flight Sciences to build competing designs for contracts worth $29 million. And by early 2025, they worked together to conclude that the technology had actually matured enough to hand off to the military industrial complex, I mean the industry, and the final direction 
and prototype is expected to be fielded by 2027 ish if you're gonna keep telling me that we're not in another cold war it doesn't help the case that we keep rehashing every military concept like this from the first cold war a darpa official overseeing the program named alexander wallon spoke to breaking defense and he said that they want it to cost around 120 million dollars each to produce these which is roughly half the cost of a c-17 and it would use far less fuel which brings us to the new Regent Viceroy. The Marines are investing $14 million into its development. Why do they think that it could work where others have failed for decades? Because of three main reasons. According to the proponents of the program, it's because technology had finally caught up and the modern mission in the Pacific makes sense now. First, modern fancy electronics have solved the biggest historical problem with wing and ground vehicles, which is their stability. I myself am, have solved that too. I'm very mentally stable right now. Fly-by-wire attached to autonomous stabilization constantly adjusts those controls to fly at the right distance from the surface in real time for the pilot. Second, the mission in the Pacific actually makes sense now. The electric version uses 12 electric motors and runs on batteries. It's limited to the distance of only about 200 miles though, but that's why there's a hybrid version that can fly at over 1,400 nautical miles, which is fast and far enough to hop from Guam to Taiwan with Without refueling, all while better avoiding enemy air defense and skipping the need for an airbase. If you look at this map on page 21 of this rundown on China's strategy, it shows why this is so important. The section in blue that you see there where is that are where the Chinese Navy would attempt to interdict American logistics and supplies with their submarines. Contested maritime logistics is nightmare. Shipping supplies to troops on islands will be incredibly dangerous. Even getting troops there is dangerous. So transporting Marines from landing ships to islands will be done under constant threat of missiles and torpedoes from enemy subs. It's an invincibility glitch against submarines. The WIG, the wing and ground concept, isn't vulnerable to sea mines or submarines and could be automated, automatically flown. Regent Defense claims to have already made automated versions that carry 50 pound payloads. This fits neatly into the Marines' new Force Design 2030 plan of operating from remote islands, so it could help small units spread out dispersed across islands to maneuver against China. It can be armed with four naval strike missiles with over 100 miles range that could be wing mounted. Or you could design it to have eight Hellfire missiles or stingers. This way you could take out incoming missiles or enemy ships anywhere near you. And third, advances in electronic and hybrid electric propulsion means that there's now fewer moving parts, lower maintenance, quieter operation, and less thermal signature. All major wins for stealth and contested logistics. Picture this, it aims to deliver 3,500 pounds of cargo to beachheads, so imagine beaches just swarming with marine platoons backed up by traditional landing craft, and able to carry over 15 reloads from Javelin missiles. The Marines are exploring whether this could offload many of their elite MARSOC units to austere beachheads as precision seating tools. This infiltration method by the Viceroy could operate from island outposts where they're equipped with manned portable missiles or launching drones for loitering weapons. Bins. The heft and the bulk, because you're going to be susceptible to undersea warfare, you're going to be susceptible to mines, you're going to be susceptible to air, to drones, and so we have to get lighter and more mobile. However, critics are still perplexed by the thing. It's called a sea glider, but it's covered in engines. What kind of glider is that? It claims to have made its first test flight in 2025, but many are still very skeptical about the technology and believe a proper full-scale test flight has yet to be shown. Many in the aviation industry believe that this is a pie-in-the-sky tech that's still far from being useful yet. It's important for me to note that critics of the program think that it'll be more useful for killing local low-flying seagulls than killing the enemy. Criticisms don't stop there, with pilots saying that the many engines will be a nightmare for maintenance and the sound that it produces will be horrific, according to them. The Chinese Navy was seen in 2025 testing out their own wing and ground aircraft that H.I. Sutton nicknamed the Boa Sea Monster as a Cold War reference. But it's unclear yet if it's powered by jets or props. We've only seen some blurry photos of it, but it seems clear that China's trying to use it as their logistics and transportation in the event of a conflict in the South China Sea. Modern day amphibious assaults are nothing like they were back in World War II when you'd load up in a Higgins landing craft and creep to shore at a leisurely pace 
all while under hail of artillery and machine gun fire from the enemy. But today, those assaults will be lousy with precision missiles flying at your face. From Cold War Soviet fever dream joke to 21st century logistics savior, the wing and ground concept is officially back. The question is, do you guys think it's a good idea or a waste of money? Do you think this is overhyped and it'll never happen? What type of weapon systems would you like to see crammed on it? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, ending transmission.